In today's video, I'm answering all of your questions. Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. First things first, I really need to apologize. I asked you to ask me questions five months ago and I just realized that I never answered them. So, <laughs> given that I'm a little bit under the weather uh, this week and I spend a lot of time in bed, I thought let's just at least be productive and answer your questions. Now I've also already filmed for an hour and just realized that I filmed in slow motion which doesn't record sound so my plan was to make a few supports while answering your questions but I'm almost done making supports and we're starting the video fresh. As always with my Q&A's every single question will be a timestamp down in the description so you can skip to the question that's most relevant to you but of course I would appreciate if you watch all of them. This is more of a podcast video so it's probably not a video that's super visual. The idea is really that you maybe put it on and get on top of your own plant chores. So let's get started. Alrighty, in the first year of your plant journey, how did you prepare your plants for the change from summer to winter? And if you could go back in time, is there anything you would do differently? I didn't prepare them at all. Um, look, it's not like it's summer one day and then winter the other. There's a gradual change usually and kind of autumn prepares them for winter. But if there's one thing that I would do differently now is I would probably look into supplementing conditions much earlier. At the beginning, I was kind of refusing to use grow lights for whatever reason. I was more like, I want to rely on natural light, which is great, but you're living in an apartment with a concrete ceiling. There will most likely not be enough natural light to make your plants thrive, especially during winter. Next question, which plants would you currently like to say goodbye to and why? Is there a plant that you've had to chuck into the trash recently? What makes a plant unsavable to you? All right, what makes a plant unsavable to me? Probably stem rot. If it has stem rot, it's gonna be really hard to kind of recover from that. If it has root rot, you can usually propagate the plant and it grows a new root system. If it drops all of its leaves, but it has a healthy root system, yes, then it will reshoot as well. But if kind of there's something wrong with the stem and the rot is kind of, yes, my baby, yes, the rot is just spreading, then you're gonna have a hard time recovering from that. Bradley. Um, did I have to chuck any plants in the trash? For sure. Plants still die in my care as well. Over winter I had my lupinum and my billy die. And I'm pretty sure there was others. I just honestly can't remember. I paid them no mind. I don't care. It is what it is. I don't take it personally or don't necessarily think of it as a sign of me being a bad plant parent. And are there any plants that I would currently like to say goodbye to? No, I don't say goodbye to them. I just put them in my garden and let them survive there. And usually when I put them in the garden, they do really well. And because I have to do very little for them, I kind of start appreciating the plant again. All right, next question. Have you ever thought about growing your own sphagnum moss and do you think that would be feasible? From how many plants would this be? From how many plants would this be worth it? I struggle finding sustainable sphagnum moss in France. Honestly, I've never really considered it, but I reckon given the amount of plants and moss pots I have, it would be not very, very not necessarily feasible for me. I don't know how long it takes. I think it takes about five years for the sphagnum moss to grow until it's harvested. I could be wrong. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily feasible for me, but I also have access to sustainably harvested sphagnum moss from New Zealand. So uh, it's not necessarily something that I really ever had the need uh, to look into. So I'm probably of no good help. Um, but what I can suggest is potentially just looking into alternatives to sphagnum moss in the first place. You, I'm putting these grow vertical poles together so they have plastic backing and a grid mesh at the front and I'll link them in the description as always. And um, with the plastic backing you can also use other materials in that pile. So you could for example put aeroid mix in here or just bark or just cocoa and, or just a tree fern fiber and so on. So maybe just look into alternatives to sphagnum moss if you can't source it. Are there things you wish you'd known or done earlier that would make 
you better at planting. Oh my god, my baby is so cute. There you go, hello. Uh, yes, I think if I could go back in time, I would love to have understood the difference between conditions and care much earlier because I think it would have made this plant hobby so much more enjoyable and less stressful. Let me explain. Conditions versus care, and I've got a full video on that that I'll link in the description if you want to learn more about it. But short version is basically conditions are things like light, temperature, airflow, humidity. And if a plant, and we're talking about plants thriving here, not just survival, right? I mean, so plants can survive in a variety of conditions, but I want my plants to thrive to their best potential, or to their full potential, not just survive. So if you want your plant to thrive, you need to grow them in conditions that are kind of predetermined by the plant and it's based on their natural environment. So if you grow a high altitude cloud forest plant, like Veracosum, for example, that plant wants high humidity and lower temperatures. Versus if you buy a grow very, uh, like a cactus, for example, that cactus wants heat and dry. Um, that is determined by the plant. It's in the plant's DNA what conditions it needs to really thrive to its full potential. That's not for you to choose. So what you can do is you can either choose the plant and then supplement the conditions to suit the plants or you can assess your conditions and then choose plants that suit your natural conditions in the first place. Then, once you've done that, then you need to care for the plant to realize the potential that the conditions have set. And care are things like moss piles, potting mixes, potting size, fertilizer, fertilizing routine, watering routine, and so on, right? Like cleaning the leaves, that's all kind of care. Now, when it comes to care, there is no right or wrong necessarily. Um, there's flexibility and it always depends on the conditions that the plants are in as well. So I feel like sometimes at the beginning, some of my plants died and I thought it was me. I thought I cared for them wrong. I did something wrong. Oh, I water too often or I blah, 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 blah. Maybe it wasn't me. Maybe I tried the impossible. Maybe I tried to grow a plant in conditions that were just not suitable to the plant. And I think that is what I see very often. People order a plant from overseas, come, they come from a very tropical climate and then they are sitting somewhere in the northern hemisphere um, in the middle of winter, the plant arrives, it dies and you think that you've done something wrong. You haven't, you know, oh, you shouldn't have planted it in this medium or so on. Maybe, it, maybe you were tasked with an impossible task in the first place. So. I think that made it so much easier on me as a plant grower because I understand that not all plants are meant to thrive in the first place in the conditions that I've got and I'm more realistic with my expectations and I'm not so harsh on myself. Um, your plant leaves your plant leaves seem to be in great condition. Do you experience any problems with them, like fungus, problems with unfurling and so on? Don't think I have any problems with unfurling because the part of Sydney that I live in is naturally quite humid and I'm very consistent with my watering, so no problems with unfurling here. But of course, in general, I still uh, encounter problems. Sometimes my plants have root rot. Sometimes uh, my plants have pests. Sometimes my plants just grow a bloody yellow leaf and so on. That is totally fine. And I think the moment you stop encountering any problems, this hobby will probably get a little boring. Or if you encounter anybody who tells you that they don't have any problems, then I can guarantee to you that they are lying. Next question. Why did you move to Australia? Was that the one and only destination or did you think about other places to live? I basically finished high school and I really wanted to do like a, a working holiday year and I wanted it to be an English speaking country. So there was really only America, Canada, UK and Australia. Surely there's other countries, but I mean, those were really the main four. I was 19 at the time and I had a lot of autonomy already. And you know, in Germany, you can really like start buying alcohol and go clubbing when you were 16. So I really didn't want to go back to being a minor. Um, so America was out of the window. Oh, there's New Zealand as well. I did actually go to New Zealand as well, don't worry. Uh, Canada, way too cold. UK, way too close. So Australia it is. And my mom has friends in Australia as well. So she's been to Australia, uh, I think four or five times before I even came here for the first time. So she was like, oh, if you go to Australia, you have 
like a support system over there. So in case something goes wrong, there's always somebody there who can support me. Uh, plus she really loves it here. So she's like, I think you should check out Australia. You'll love it too. And 11 and a half years later, I'm still here. What are your thoughts on terracotta pods? I have gone with more of a rustic theme in designing my home and terracotta is a perfect fit. Um, you have a more modern design, so terracotta might not might be a bit off. But if you want to try, there's a huge variety of designs. Uh, and I find I worry less about soil aeration and overwatering when using terracotta. Spot on. Um, aeration is usually better with terracotta because it's actually, I think the word is porous, um, so it can breathe and it can also um, weak out water basically. So if you're an overwaterer, if you're having problems with drainage aeration, terracotta is probably a better option to, to plastic. Um, reason I don't like to use terracotta because it's mainly because of aesthetic reasons. I just don't necessarily like the look of it. And I like having all of my plants in see-through nursery pots. It lets me uh, assess the moisture as well as the root health uh, just by looking at it. And because they're in these plastic pots, I can very easily just move them around. I used to have to rely on my bathtub for all my plant care. All of my plants moved into my bathtub every Saturday for watering. If they were all in terracotta, that would just make life so much harder. Terracotta obviously makes your poles more bottom heavy, so in that regard it's good, but I just fixed that problem by giving all of my pots a cash pot. Um, and then because they're all in light plastic pots, I can also really easily just move them around and switch them around, create nice displays. So I love my approach um, and I think it fits my aesthetic and my way of caring for my plant best, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with terracotta if that's what you want to use. How are the plants in your greenhouse doing? What are your plans for it during the next growing season and what will be the first change or update to it you plan to make? Now keep in mind this question was asked five months ago and I've done three videos on my greenhouse in between. So I feel like your question might have been answered, but basically it's going really well. I absolutely love it. It's been like the best thing I've ever done. Eh, not ever done, but I really like it. It's up there. Um, but definitely underestimated the importance of being able to control and supplement conditions. So I think that is really the main challenge that I'm facing with the greenhouse and I'll be facing that with the upcoming winter season as well. So how can I cool it in summer? How can I heat it in winter without uh, breaking the bank? That's basically the challenge. Uh, once you've got good conditions in there, comes back to the conditions versus care uh, conversation. Once you've got great conditions in there, the care approach is pretty easy. You just go in there and hose it all down. Have you ever noticed hydrophobic spots in your aeroid mixture and when, when watering your plants? Sometimes I notice them and not sure if that means that I'm watering them enough. Thank you so much. So hydrophobic means that it can't absorb water or it repels water. Now sometimes something become, can become hydrophobic by it drying out too much. So moss for example becomes hydrophobic when it's really dry. You then need to very slowly moist, re-moisten it until it's like moist and then all of the water absorption capacity is really unlocked. So sometimes your mix can become hydrophobic because you let it dry out too much uh, and then it has a hard time absorbing water. Imagine rain in the desert, all of the soil would have dried out completely and when it then rains the soil can't absorb that water and everything just runs off. Um, that would be the same. So maybe you're actually not watering enough. I think that's what you also said, right? Yeah, I think it means that you're not watering them enough, but it could also just be the age of the medium. Eventually the medium might just become a little eh and doesn't really absorb water that well anymore. I haven't experienced that with my aeroid mix and um, I've never really experienced anything with my aeroid mix becoming hydrophobic either. But I think some people experiencing the very cocoa fiber or cocoa peat heavy mixes. One moment. Why did you rip? So yeah, again, I'm not a major help, but maybe it is not enough watering or like letting it dry out too much. Maybe it is just the age of the medium as well. If it's a fresh batch of air white mix, then uh, you shouldn't necessarily experience that issue. Sorry, Brad. Red does not like this. Psh, everything is fine. It's just a little bit of sticky tape, yeah? Okay, 
Wow, it's very scary, I know. What's the most important for your plants in winter? Keep in the temperatures or give them more light? Mmm, tricky one. It's usually a combination of things. You can't just do one or the other. Imagine you put your plant in a completely dark room at perfect temperatures, your plant isn't gonna grow. Imagine you give your plant amazing light, but it's minus two degrees and the plant can't handle frost plant will also die. So it's always a combination of things, of course. But if you really have to choose one or the other, or if I have to say that one is more important than the other, then I'd say that good light and okay temperatures will give you better growth than great conditions and okay light. Light always sets the growth potential. I recently switched most of my plants to a chunky aeroid mix. In a previous video you said you gauge if the plant needs water by looking for condensation. I'm not noticing that sometimes I won't see any condensation but when I stick my finger in the pot it feels damp. Any suggestions uh, on how I can get a better idea of when to water using your aeroid mix? I think the condensation thing only really happens if there's some sort of a, if the temperature of the mix is different to the temperature of the outside or something like that. So for example, if I take one of my plants that is growing inside and it's at inside temperature and I take it outside and it's cooler outside, that's when I start seeing condensation on the outside of the pot. The condensation part doesn't necessarily always work if everything is kept at the same temperature, if that makes sense. So understand where you're coming from but there's a few other ways you can assess the watering needs you can look at the color of the mix when it's wet it's a little darker when it's dry it's a little lighter in color you can assess it by the weight the lighter the pot feels the less water is retained within the pot and of course you can also stick your finger in it but i find this to be very challenging even with these you know the soil moisture meters that you can buy i find it really tricky because my aerobic mix is so chunky that meter can just hit an air pocket and tell me that it's super dry but i just watered it so i never trust these meters they're not really designed for chunky aerobic mix i reckon a good way to assess it is also just by looking at the plant is the plant a little droopy are the leaves maybe a little bit curled uh, if, if they are, then it needs water. If the plant looks super perky, then uh, it might not need water. But with the chunky aeroid mix, I also wouldn't necessarily be all too worried about overwatering. It's not like you have this like three hour watering window that you have to hit. If you water it a day or two too early or a day or two too late, I think the plant should be just fine, at least from my experience. I don't have a super strict regimented watering schedule i just walk around and see what could potentially need water just based on when i last watered it and so on but that's definitely some sort of like feeling that i just developed over the last few years so if you don't have that feeling just yet then uh yeah stick to one of the three tips um, i gave earlier um hello i love watching your videos and seeing all of your plants thank you a question is what is the best way to adapt plants that are established in soil into a soilless mix such as your aeroid mix blah blah so i'm just paraphrasing a little bit it's a long question sometimes plants that i have do wonderful and then others are about to die so i take them out of the aeroid mix and put them back in the original media have you ever had this problem could you tell me what the problem might be? Like I said, sometimes they do wonderfully and other times they don't. Thanks so much. Give Brett cuddles for me, please. Bradley, little cuddles for you. Yes, my baby. Cuddles, cuddles, cuddles. Um, okay. Not all too much information in there for me, so it's a little bit hard. I need to read between the lines. I don't necessarily know what plants uh, you put in there and I don't necessarily know what age these plants were, whether they were like truly established or if they're just established in a pot, but they're still quite juvenile. Now, first things first, my chunky aeroid mix is really designed for aeroids. So for example, if I'd put a begonia in that, it would probably not do all too well. So it's a really chunky mix that relies on, that is designed for plants that are really chunky roots that enjoy the aeration. Um, Aeroids, sometimes when juvenile, also don't have the chunkiest roots uh, yet. So the smaller the plant, the finer the roots, the more water retentive the mix really should be. 
Now, if the plant is perfectly fine in the medium that it came with and you don't have an issue with the medium when it comes to the care, let's say, then don't fix what's not broken. Don't transfer everything into Aeroid Mix just because I said it. But if you want to repot it and you want to incorporate a more aerated and uh, well-draining mix to prevent overwatering in the future, then uh, maybe just start by adding a few chunky components into the existing mix. So maybe take when you repot it, take 50% of the existing medium and then 50% of aeroid mix, mix it all together and then repot the plant. So the plant has some of the medium that it's familiar with, but it also has some new chunkier medium that kind of give you the components or to give you the qualities that you want like aeration and drainage. Do you collect rainwater for your plants? Any recommendations on rainwater versus tap water versus filtered water? Um, I don't, but I make an effort of putting as many plants outside when it rains as possible so that the plant can just be washed clean by mother nature and uh, you know take advantage of rainwater. Plants love rainwater. That is what they would get in nature. Um, if you don't have the luxury of doing that or it's not raining frequently enough if, wherever you live to take advantage of the rain, then um, if you use tap water, um, well tap water is different all across the world, right? Every country, every city has different tap water. So maybe look into your tap water and see if that is, um, is good uh, for plants or not. Honestly, I have never really looked into it. I don't really, I don't know. I just trust the results and obviously my plants don't seem to be all too upset. But what I do do is I take the water and I put it in... Um, a big 20 liter container and I let it sit at room temperature for a day or two especially in winter so that the water can at least be the temperature that the plant wants right sometimes the water that comes out of the tap can be really really cold especially in winter hey Jan what do you think about lechuza pond and self-watering pots I don't think lechuza pond is really a thing in Australia you can get your hands on it but it's not very common. I've ne not really seen many people do it and I personally haven't really felt the need for it either. Um, and then self-watering. I'm not the biggest fan of self-watering. I feel like watering, that is my job as a plant person. Uh, but realistically, I don't, necess I don't think my plants and or the mix that I use, my aeroid mix is necessarily um, designed to be used in a self-watering capacity, right? I think that self-watering probably works perfect if you have begonias or ferns in like a really water retentive mix that really doesn't want to dry out. What are a genus of plants that you avoid or aeroids that you don't want to get into? Hoyas, it's just not really giving me anything, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I know there's a lot of people that really are really into Hoyas, so there must be something about them that I just haven't really discovered yet, but to me, they're not necessarily really interesting or something I want to get into. And then when it comes to aeroids, I love my aeroids. I think Syngoniums are not like my favorite favorite. Just wondering, where did your plant journey start for you and what made you buy your first plant? And do you still have that special plant? P.S. Love the honesty about there's no routine to plant keeping. Thank you. Well, I think honesty is honestly the way to go. What's the point in me pretending like everything is super easy when in reality it's not? Um, I don't necessarily remember my first plant, to be honest. I think, I mean... I, d I don't know. I think I definitely remember like the first like house plant or like the first aeroid I think was uh, Monstera adansonii I think or maybe some hard leafed philodendron or something like that. And then I think the first like rare plant or like plant that I really was like yes and uh, mm, was I think philodendron gloriosum shortly followed by Milano and Vericosum. So I kind of went straight into the velvets and I think, yeah, that really made me get obsessed with plants because I was like, wow, this is really, really pretty. This is like different. This is not necessarily what I expected when I first got into the hobby. And yes, I still have um, my original Vericosum and my original Milano Chrysum. I think I still have my original Gloriosa, currently just chopped into single note cuttings, recovering, I think. 
what was the smallest plant you put on a moss pole? I'm thinking about putting baby plants on moss poles because they have already started growing aerial root. Is root rot possible in your air rot mix if the pot is way too big? Who said you need a big pot? Um, check out my recent video about the El Choco. Um, I put this on a tiny moss pole in a tiny pot. The El Choco started on one of these tiny poles in a 10 centimeter pot. I then transferred this to a larger pole and now I can just extend the larger pole indefinitely. Um, so you don't need to start it on a huge moss pole. Specifically the grow verticals can actually be converted into the larger one eventually. So have a look at that video and that was also the smallest plant I've ever put on a moss pile. It was literally the tiniest little tissue culture tissue culture baby but it had these roots and I just really wanted those, those roots to take advantage of a moss pile as soon as possible and I think that's really what helped me get such good growth in such short amount of time. So um, if I would have not given it that initial moss pile I reckon it would have taken twice as long for it to actually establish. Next question, how often do you replace the moss in your moss pole? Is it necessary? If so, how do you manage to? Never. I have never replaced moss in any of my moss poles. Now my plants outgrow their moss poles quite frequently and then I chop and extend and I keep growing the top part, right? The bottom part eventually I take apart or the bottom part I just use for the plant to reshoot to grow on the new pole and then I discard the bottom part eventually. Leaves only have a you know limited type, uh, lifespan as well, so eventually these leaves will just become ugly, yellow, drop off, and then you just have a bare stem, so you can just propagate it and start new plants and so on. So these moss poles are not forever solutions. Um, that's why I don't necessarily endorse growing on like a wooden plank, because what are you gonna do when the plant reaches the top? Like the plank seems like a very forever solution when we know that it's not gonna be a forever thing. So no, I never really had to replace moss in my moss pole if that makes sense because my chop and extend process just ensures that no moss pole is really that old. The oldest moss pole I have is probably my Sodiroy, which is probably like three years-ish by now. Um, and the plant is such a slow grower that it's only halfway up its pole and it's still fine. I didn't have to replace any. Yes, moss decomposes over time, which means that eventually you might notice that you have more of a gap at the top because the moss just compresses and the water kind of just pushes everything down. And then you just put a little bit more moss on the top. Done. Um, so I haven't really noticed it needing replacement, so I've never done it. How do you mix substrate for alocasia, specifically alocasia jacqueline? Thank you. Um, I use my normal potting mix um, as always, and it's always linked in my description, and I use that for pretty much all of my aeroids with alocasias. Sometimes I just add a little bit more pumice to it. I've noticed I just really like that. But I have so many plants. They're, in the grand scheme of things, they're all very similar. So I definitely don't customize the mix for each individual species or even genus. That would be way too much work. Plus, if each species would have a customized mix, then it also means that each mix would probably have to be watered in a different frequency, which would then make watering so much harder and so on as well. So I really just go with my standard aeroid mix and then everybody gets the same treatment. Done. Do you have a vlog channel? If not, would you start one? I enjoy your plant content, but would also like to hear more about your vegan journey. I, I always wondered about this. I always thought it was so weird when people start having a second channel. Like, why? Why can't I just upload all of the content to the same channel? If somebody doesn't want to watch the vlogs, then they don't have to watch the vlogs. They can just wait for the next video to come out that's not a vlog. So I have vlogs, but they're all just on this channel. But maybe somebody can enlighten me. Like, why, why would I do separate channels for this? And I'm probably not going to talk too much about my vegan journey because... I'm just not prepared for all of the shit fight in the comment section. People get very, very defensive when it comes to their eating habits and yeah as a vegan you don't make all too many friends 
online, to be honest. Um, people really hate vegans. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm very, very opinionated about this topic. So it's really hard for me to not actually speak up about it. But I also know that once I do speak up about it, I'm not super tolerant towards other people's opinions on that topic. So if I'm not willing to hear other people's opinion on this topic, I probably shouldn't talk too much about it. Right? But yeah, I think from the past conversations I've had with people in person um, at work and at uni and, and so on uh, with my friends, with my family, I know that the acceptance of a vegan lifestyle is still very low, which I honestly don't understand. To me, it is an absolute no-brainer to not eat animals. I mean, how can I have this cute little animal right next to me over here and then go into the kitchen, sit down and eat another one? How can we have laws that protect cats and dogs because they're considered pets, but we're literally like celebrating the slaughter of billions of animals every year. Anyway, okay, see, see how I get really passionate about this and I'm really, I can be really harsh with my uh, choice of words because I like to poke the bear. So I kind of just made the rule for myself to not talk about it too much because I'm just not ready to wake up to a shit fight every morning in my comment section. That is just not necessarily what I want to do. Bloop. What's your treatment strategy for the dreaded spider mite? I'd love to hear your input. Thanks. Okay, pest treatment. I hate talking about it. So let's make it quick. I still use Vitality Plus. I don't know the active ingredient in Vitality Plus and it's not disclosed. And I believe that is the reason why Vitality Plus has been discontinued. So I'm looking for an alternative. People in the comment section have been telling me about neem oil for the longest time. And it's not like I've never used neem oil, but trust me, I've never used neem oil with success. So I don't really know. So I still use the little bit of Vitality Plus that I still have and I'm looking for a new solution. But actually, and oh, I don't even want to say it because I'm worried I'm going to jinx something. But this year I've had the least pest issues ever. I haven't really had much issues. And when I do see an issue, like for example, my Alocasia Jacqueline had spider mites the other day. I honestly just cut her leaf off and throw it out. I'm like, I can't even be asked to deal with that because I know these spider mites are gonna keep coming back. So I'm not hesitant in just chopping some leaves off if I just see too many spider mites on there. But most of the time, because I hoist my plants down, I put them in the rain, the plants that grow outside don't really have spider mite issues all too much anyway. Because I keep my leaves clean and healthy, they seem to naturally not attract all too many pests. Pests are more likely to take advantage of dying leaves as well. So maybe even just things of like me cutting uh, dead leaves uh, off really quickly. When I see a leaf that doesn't look good or it's starting to deteriorate, I usually just cut it. I don't let it go all yellow and like let the plant soak up the nutrients or like bring back the nutrients or something like that. I'll just cut it because it's an eyesore. But I reckon not having these ugly leaves around or the like these dying leaves around might also stop pests from really having a field day. I don't know. I honestly don't have these huge pest issues that I hear about online. I don't know if people like to exaggerate or not. That doesn't mean that I don't have pests. I always have pests, but they're not they're not strong enough to cause actual issues, if that makes sense. I kind of just learn to live with them and accept them rather than constantly fighting them. Yeah, I know this answer is going to get me hate from anybody who's lost a plant to pests before. Sorry. Where do you get all or most of your houseplants? Online or shops? I do buy a little bit online, but majority is coming from AJ's at Growing Grounds and i link her in the description as well. She's amazing. She posts Australia wide. Um, I have no idea about international growers, sorry. Have you ever tried growing a crawler as a climber? Yes, I have, and no, it doesn't work. 
Now in fight nature, work with it if you want to have amazing results. I started growing my Monstera adansonia on a moss pole, but I usually run into the problem that my pot is wet and the pole is dry. I try to water the pole frequently in small amounts. I do have a well draining soil and a pot with drainage holes. Do I have to make additional holes on the bottom for drainage or the sides for airflow? Um, I personally don't. You can totally do that if you want to, but you only just started to grow your Monstera adansonia on a moss pole. Like, I don't know, based on your comment, nothing has gone wrong yet. So I think you might just anticipating an issue that will never come. Whatever you're doing or the way you're explaining it sounds perfect. And proof is going to be in the pudding. Watch your adansonii thrive and uh, you might never really have any issues in the first place. But yeah. Sounds like you're doing everything really, really well. That's exactly how I would do it and it's working for me. How deep are your transparent pots? I feel like mine are impossible to stabilize with a water bottle on them and wondering if my pots are just shallower than yours should be the same width. I think when I measured them, the 20 centimeter pot is 20 centimeters in diameter and about 24 centimeters deep. Now, the depth of the pot, I'm not sure when you say it's impossible to stabilize if you're referring to the pole and pot combination not being stable or if the pole within the pot is not stable. I'm assuming the second because that would probably be a result of the pot being quite shallow. Yes, definitely. If the pot is really shallow, then obviously the moss pole might be a little bit more wobbly, um, but it could also be the substrate. If you use a very fine substrate, the moss pole can just move through that fine substrate really easily. If you use a very chunky mix, the chunky components kind of just lock everything in place, if that makes sense. And that's also what locks the pole in place so I can just pick it up by the pole. So maybe just see if your mix is chunky enough it might not have anything to do with the shallowness, that's not a word, of your pot. Hi Jan, who is your tennis goat? Goat stands for greatest of all time, by the way. And what plant is your goat? Tennis goat, Roger Federer, Serena Williams. I did um, actually presentations on both of them in high school and college. And what is your plant goat? Wow, do I really have to choose one? <sighs> I think philodendron varicosum. It's on the struggle bus at the moment, but if you have a thriving varicosum, mm, I doubt you can beat that. All right, do you have any anthuriums other than crystallinum and vitarifolium? If so, then what type uh, is easy to care for? If not, do you ever want to get another type? Another question is, do you have any Hamalomina, hal, ha, homalom, you know this one. Uh, they remind me of philodendron. I don't know if they climb though. I don't think uh, hamalominas, hamalomina, that one uh, are climbing. I think I've only ever seen them kind of grow in a cluster. Uh, and no, I don't have any of them. Um, do you have any other anthuriums? Yes. Uh, I actually just recently made a full video on my entire Anthurium collection and my care tips. So I do think, because I'm five months late to answer your questions, your question has probably already been answered. Now, easy to care for ones, I don't know. You guys know I have a specific type. All of my plants are fairly similar. So I don't necessarily think I have the variety of Anthuriums to really assess whether one is easier to care for than the other. Plus they're all in the same conditions, they all get the same care. So. I do have Anthurium Bosworth Beauty actually and I forgot that in the video um, and she's just in the garden and she was in the garden all winter long as well so she really is resilient. Alright next one, what's your trick for keeping your moss pots from going dry? Being in New Zealand, <laughs> yes my baby, being in New Zealand in winter means I have to keep aircon on the whole time and it's paying havoc with my moss pots and my poor plants. I missed every second day and things are still drying too much. First things first, misting really only covers the surface of the pole. The surface is obviously what's going to dry out really quickly again. So I wouldn't necessarily bother misting the surface of the pole because you're basically just, what do you call it? There's a saying, is it like counting sand on the beach or something like that? Anyway, basically 
your efforts are pretty much wasted. I would thoroughly water the moss poles from the inside out using the water bottle upside down technique. That way is also much cleaner and way less effort so you might not mind doing it a little more frequently. Now other reasons to prevent your poles from drying out would be to have them in a more humid environment. So obviously based on your question I'm assuming that that's not necessarily a possibility because you already identified the reason why they dry out so quickly. So if you could somehow move them away from the aircon that would probably be preferable. You can group your poles together to create a little humidity island as well. You could make your poles a little bigger, have them plastic backed or hold more moss. Moss is what retains the moisture so we want to make sure that the moss can retain the moisture for as long as possible. The more moss the more water retention, the more water retention the less time until it dries out. So to get more moss in your moss pile, you can either just make it bigger or you can tight, uh, pack it tighter. But don't pack it too tight as well because that can mess with aeration. Plastic backed moss piles just reduce the surface area that the moss uh, has. Less surface area, less contact with the air. The air is what is dry and sucks out all of the water from the moss. So reducing the surface area that the moss has in half uh, should also increase the water retention uh, or double the water retention if that makes sense. So those are things you can change with your moss pile construction uh, that stops them from drying out uh, so quickly. But I reckon you probably want a combination of all three. You want to have the proper watering technique, you want to have it in an environment that doesn't let the pole dry out so quickly and you want to have a pole that doesn't dry out so much in the first place. We're getting through these. Me not being distracted by making poles is definitely a much better Q&A um, experience I think but you guys know I like to uh, multitask but I can multitask and cuddle my baby. Um, would love to hear your thought process behind deciding on starting a climbing filo with multiple cuttings and how many of them versus growing it up a moss pile until it's two moss piles high chopping it in half then growing them side by side until they reach a single Moss pole to get two main stalks on one pole. Okay, so basically what I do sometimes, I just let one cutting grow up a moss pole, I cut that in half, I plant both moss poles next to each other, so now I basically have two plants, I extend one of them and then I let both plants grow onto the new pole, so then I have one pole with two plants on it. I could also get there by having two cuttings on one pole and then starting it. So I could just do the propagation at the very beginning, cut it in two bits, put it on the moss pole uh, rather than doing it at the end. Now honestly I don't really have a major thought process behind it. It really depends on so many factors. A lot of these plants I already started like a year and a half ago with just one cutting on a moss pole before I even had the idea to plant two moss poles together. So I wasn't necessarily aware of the option by the time I set them up. Um, hindsight is 2020. Yeah? Um, sometimes I don't necessarily want to propagate the plant when it's still really small. When you propagate the plant when it's really small it's going to set it back in uh, progress much more and it's going to take much longer to establish the plants. Whereas if you propagate the plant by the time it grew up the moss pile the plant has so much of a root system it recovers really really quickly. It also just depends on the plant. Do I even want two of the same plant on the pole? Sometimes I don't necessarily know until I've seen the plant grow in a little bit and see how fast it can grow up. Like my Glorious for example that's just one plant on one pole but it's so big and has such a big spread I wouldn't know what to do with it if there was multiple plants on there. It doesn't need multiple plants. Whereas a plant like my Micans for example I think there's like 12 plants on there by now because each leaf is really small so I can have a really nice lush look. Um, so yeah I honestly just decide then and there. It also depends on how readily available the plant is. So for example I bought a Monstera Indonesian marble the other day and it was okay priced so I just bought two so I can just start with two plants on the same moss pile straight away. Why not? If it's a really expensive plant then I would just buy one and propagate it myself. It depends on how much room I have available. It depends on where about the, about the moss pole is. Sometimes the moss pole is kind of like stuck in a corner or is up against a wall so having multiple cuttings on it might not actually really look 
better. It might actually just make it look messier. Whereas sometimes I want to have a moss pot more in the center of a room and I would love for it to have plants all around it. Then I'll probably propagate it early on at multiple cuttings and then let them grow up. Depends on how fast the plant grows, how easy it sizes up and so on. So I don't necessarily have a thought process. I honestly just wing it. And sometimes I make the right decisions. Sometimes I make the wrong decisions, but that's okay. It is what it is. Another really easy way for you to multiply the plant while it's on the pole is honestly just chop the growth point. So you have one, one, one vine growing up a moss pole, before it reaches the top of its moss pole, just chop the growth point and most likely the two, uppers, uh, the two newest nodes will both reshoot and then you have two shoots on, uh, on that pole and then when you do your chop and extend then you know, now you also have two and so on. So there are multiple ways of propagating the plants using moss poles um, and that's the beauty of it right there's flexibility you can change your mind later on as well uh, yeah i don't know if i'm really helpful with these q and a's but maybe one thing that hopefully comes across is that there is no rule book right that i follow or that i even invented or anything like that i honestly make things up as i go and i change my mind and i try new things every now and then um, and see if it works and I'm just here to share it with you so you can see inspiration and maybe decide which one of these methods you want to try out. All right, next one, two-part fart. What do you do when a plant has trouble unfurling a leaf? What are your thoughts on trailing Milano Chrysum? Saw one on Google and it would be interesting in a greenhouse. All right, let's answer the second one first because I feel like that it will be faster. Trailing Milano Chrysum, no desire. I feel like Mykins would make a much better trailing plant. I already have a hard time sizing up Milano. As a climber, I feel like as a trailer, there is no chance of you actually getting these desirable, nice, elongated leaves. So might as well just go with a plant that trails and grows much easier, like a Mykins, for example. But doesn't mean that it can't be done. Like, do it. Why not? Next time you propagate it, have one trailing and one climbing. Why not? Actually, I have one propagating right now, and I might actually do that. So going against everything that I said, but... I actually have one in propagation at the moment, so maybe I'll just do that. Could be good in my greenhouse, as you said. Let's see, proof is in the pudding, so yeah, actually, I'm intrigued. I might actually try it, but that's because I have multiple of that, right? If I would only have one Milano, I would definitely not choose to make it a trialing plant. What do you do when a plant has trouble unfurling a leaf? And I think I answered that earlier already. Jesus, I've been sitting here all day. Um, I don't really have that. But I've heard that you can just wrap a wet towel or wet paper towel around it um, and that should help it unfurl. But I rather look at why is it having issues unfurling in the first place. It might be a conditions problem, most likely humidity. So if the humidity is really low, maybe that has to do with it. But most of the time a leaf having problems unfurling can also be inconsistent watering. So. Uh, maybe just be a little more consistent with your watering specifically if you see that the plant is growing a new leaf unfurling a new leaf that new leaf will also need extra water to inflate right? next question what are your plant aspirations moving forward that is a really good question and i could probably talk to you about this all day i think there are multiple parts to it now when it comes to doing the things that you guys know me for growing large aeroids indoors Definitely just want to keep doing with that. But I think my ambition to grow some of these plants even bigger and bigger and bigger is not as strong as it was a couple of years ago. I think by now I have so many plants that I also find uh, enjoyment out of just the volume let's say uh, rather than just f making sure that every single plant is growing as large as possible. So sometimes having a few smaller plants is also nice. Now I also started getting really really small tissue culture plants uh, similar to the El Choco that I showed you uh, that, that I spoke about earlier and these um, these I want to grow up um, to maturity um, where I can. So it would be nice to have 
different plants to the ones that I've grown over the land. And I'm not saying that I'm not going to grow the plants that I've already have, but I think I'm really excited to see some of my newer plants grow up a little bit and become these sort of showstoppers um, that I want to grow. But in general, I think when it comes to my plant aspirations, I'm really trying to broaden my horizons a little bit. So, for example, growing in a greenhouse and growing different plants in a greenhouse. For example, I'm growing like a pitcher plant and it's my favorite plant in there at the moment. I love it. I want to grow more carnivorous plants, specifically pitcher plants. Um, maybe I want to grow, I have a begonia in my bathroom that's currently thriving. So I was thinking maybe my bathroom should be my begonia room. I'm not too sure about that, to be honest. Then um, I want to, obviously I'm doing gardening. I'm growing some veggies now. So learning different things about plants. Um, the Botanic Garden Tour has really broadened my interest in uh, the outside world as well, right? I was so focused and just looking at my monsters inside my apartment. I was completely unaware of what's happening out there. And now that I have this heightened awareness of it i see amazing plants left right and center everywhere i'm more in tune with the seasons and when things are flowering and then I'm, I'm really excited about it i'm so into like my banksias and my proteas and so on at the moment as well so i think it's just really broadening my horizons and understanding that there are so many more plants than just aeroids but i definitely love my aeroids for my indoors and i think they're the best way to create a nice jungle feel at home so don't worry i'm not gonna stop doing what i'm doing i love my moss pals i love all of that but i need to keep this hobby interesting um, and hopefully that makes better content eventually as well. Um, is there any wishlist plant you'd like that seems unattainable due to price availability, etc.? Um, actually, if you would have asked me that question a couple of weeks ago, I would have said no, but I just finished editing the video, um, the Grow Vertical tour, where I visited uh, Tim from Grow Vertical um, and his amazing collection and I really want a philodendron luxuriance, which is very impossible at the moment in Australia, to be honest. So it's not necessarily on my wish list because I'm not willing to spend that much money on a plant, but it's definitely a plant I'm looking forward to becoming more available. Most of the time when I make a plant purchase, it's very impulse. It's not necessarily, oh, I wanted this plant for so long. If I want something, I usually get it. So. They don't usually get or go on my wish list. They just go in my basket. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, look, I love being an adult. I love to spur myself. Why not? You only live once. Come on. What's your least favorite part of your plant hobby? Probably that they're relying on me so much. Like, while I love my plant care for the majority of the year, it is definitely a little nerve wracking when I go on leave, on leave, when I go on holidays and I need to rely on somebody else helping me out with my plant care. Um, my setup is definitely not set and forget. It requires quite a lot of input from me and my care approach is quite hands on as well. Um, so I really need to rely on uh, my house sitter and cat sitter to help me out with my plant care as well. So that's probably my least favorite part because I like to be very self-sufficient, self-sustaining, I don't know what I, I don't like relying on other people, but it's also a learning curve. Um, when it comes to, so that's made more about my plant hobby in itself and me looking after my plants. I know most people will probably say, oh, I hate plant chores, but I reframe plant chores in my head as an opportunity to make your plants thrive. Every time you repot, every time you propagate, every time you water and provide nutrients, that is what makes your plants thrive that is what that is you realizing the growth potential that the conditions have set i love realizing potential so i don't mind plant chores i call them plant care <laughs> um but yeah i'll see them as an opportunity so that's not, definitely not the worst part maybe expanding on the question i know you didn't ask but i want to tell you anyway um 
I think the worst part of the plant community, and I think it's a question coming up later anyway, but I think the worst part of the plant community is that so often things are seen as very black and white. It's like, you must water this plant every seven days. You must do that. You must not do this. F off. I must not listen to you. Like, honestly, yes. I'm, I sometimes give these sort of tips and so on as well, but I, I'm trying making sure that when I say these things, I always frame it as this is what I do. If you want to grow your plants in the same way that I grow them, then you should do this, this and this, this and this. Doesn't mean that there isn't another way of doing it. For example, I would never say you must grow your plant in aeroid mix. You can grow it in lecker and it's also perfectly fine. Um, so I think that is sometimes what pisses me off a little bit because especially people that are new in the plant community, they just follow these tips and tricks really blindly without actually thinking them through. And it doesn't give them an opportunity to actually learn about the plants and the plant care. They're just ticking boxes. And I'm trying, and please tell me if I'm unsuccessful in doing it, but I'm trying to teach principles or te give examples, give some sort of inspiration so that people feel inspired to go and try something in their own collection but adjusted based on their time, their conditions, their plans and so on. I hope that makes sense. I'm basically trying to give people the tools that help them care for the plants themselves rather than just giving them instructions. I hope. That's my intention. Please let me know if that doesn't uh, translate. Please, please, please. Our next question. How do you manage to keep moss pots moist while you are away for more than a week? I kind of just answered that in the previous question, but I actually have a short answer for you as well. It's just one word. Timmy! How often do your moss pulse dry up? Mine go from a wet, dark color to a slightly damp every three days. It's not making crunching sounds just yet, but it seems I don't water frequently enough to have the moss turn completely green like yours. All right, the moss turning completely green like mine is not the moss coming back to life. It's algae buildup. Algae buildup is where there's highlight moisture and nutrients. So maybe you just don't have enough light or nutrients for algae to really form. You don't necessarily want algae, not that it's harmful as long as it's contained and doesn't get all slimy and so on, but I mean maybe you like the aesthetics of it, I do, um, but your goal is not to grow algae. Um, but algae growth on your moss pole can be a good indicator that you're providing your plant on the pole with sufficient light, nutrients, and water. But if you have a big plant on the pole, for example, that plant will also shade the pole, meaning the pole doesn't get all too much light, meaning there won't be algae on your pole, and so on. So you're not aiming for algae growth. What you're describing actually sounds perfectly fine. And I only water my pole when it's really crunchy, right? Uh, just because the surface of the pole might appear to be uh, dryish, uh, you don't know what the inside of the pole looks like, right? Obviously the surface is going to dry out uh, first. So if it's still slightly damp after three days, you're doing everything perfectly fine. Um, so maybe, maybe check day four, day five, and if you then feel like the pole is a bit crunchy, then go ahead and water it again. But everything that you're doing sounds perfect. Also consider if you are actually providing enough nutrients, because if there's not enough nutrients, you'll also not see uh, algae growth. But most of the time it's really light. For example, uh, over here, all of my um, anthuriums have like a layer of moss on them and it's just slightly green. The layer of moss in my greenhouse is like, dark <laughs> very dark um, almost too dark so usually uh, has something to do with light not necessarily moisture how cold is your winter over there i'm in the u.s in southern california and we are below the foothills so i'm unable to keep orchids and some philodendron outside due to some frost i think the coldest it was last year was three degrees so i don't get frost in my part of sydney um, but 
Tim from Goal Vertical, for example, who also lives in Sydney but in the Blue Mountains, so a little further west, he gets frost, for example. So that's also just, sorry, just on a little side note, because people sometimes, they're like, yeah, but you're in Australia, of course your plants grow. It's like, Australia is a very big very big place. We have snowy mountains and we have desert. Yeah, most of these aeroids cannot tolerate frost. Um, again, if they are exposed to like the three, three to four degree temperatures that I had last year and some of them were outside, they definitely weren't thriving. They definitely weren't growing. They were definitely just deteriorating and I'm just hoping that they don't die before spring comes and they have a chance to recover. So it's definitely not necessarily what I will want to do with all of my plants because I'd rather have them continuously thrive. So, but if you're just looking for survival, then um, I'd say it probably also depends on how long these temperatures are called for and so on. But I, and it depends on your aeroid. But I'm pretty confident that none of these aeroids can tolerate frost. How many plants you grow with grow lights? <clears throat> Good question. I think at the beginning of my plant journey, I didn't grow any of my plants with grow lights, and now I grow a majority of them with grow lights. Because it really depends on the place that you're living in. This place is probably the most challenged when it comes to natural light, so I have quite a few grow lights. My place before had very similar issues. Sometimes, some like the anthuriums next to me, oh, more emails, Jesus. Uh, sometimes, like my anthuriums next to me, for example, they actually do get some natural light from a south-facing window, but I also have a grow light, which you can probably see just behind the Dyson there, the big black uh, rod sticking out. Um, and that grow light just supplements the light, right? So that on a dark day, for example, they still get decent light, uh, or even, you know, just during winter, they still get more light, or even just during summer, maybe this light that it gets from the window is just not enough. The good thing with grow lights, and at the beginning I was really against them because I feel like mm, they, they weren't looking that nice, but I found some really aesthetically pleasing solutions, and I have a full video on light, which is also always linked in the description, so if you're interested. Wow, my brain can go to like seven thoughts at the same time. Anyway, so um, at the beginning I didn't really like growing with grow lights because of aesthetic reasons, um, but now that I found some aesthetically pleasing options, grow lights enable you to put plants in positions where you want them to be. If you're relying on natural light, then you're very limited with whereabouts your plants can go. Plus your natural light is probably gonna ca come in the form of a window, which means that the plant is facing the window and not facing you. So I started using grow lights to also have plants face me or face into the room or be in a dark corner of the room um, while still grow. So I really, really like grow lights and I wish I would have discovered them a little bit earlier in my journey because again, it comes back to the conditions versus care thing. A lot of plants that didn't necessarily survive or didn't necessarily grow in the way that I wanted them to grow at the beginning were due to a lack of light. So to answer your question, how many plants do you grow with grow lights? I think 80% of my plants inside my apartment have a grow light to either completely rely on it or at the very minimum to uh, have light supplemented via the grow light. What inspired you to build the greenhouse? Um, my friends, like for example, AJ's greenhouse, Tim's greenhouse. I really love what they've done. I really love the new challenge. I love the new opportunities that it brings. I love the fact that you can just hang things in there and just hoist everything down. I like taking things to the next level, learning new things, keeping things interesting and so on. So the greenhouse was the very first thing I thought about when I finally had some decent outdoor space. Next one, we're going through these now. Um, Jan, you have spoiled us with your excellent content. I'm curious if you have any plant content creators that you enjoy, recommend, inspired by, or do you find most to be annoying? <laughs> Breakfasts with very little substance. Has AJ made a YouTube channel yet? I don't do Instagram, blah, blah, blah. I don't do Instagram, etc. So I wouldn't get the memo otherwise. Yes, AJ has a YouTube channel, but she only uploads short form videos at this stage. Um, and she's just growing grounds if you look for her. Now, oh, this big question to unpack. <clears throat> 
I have to say that I'm trying to stay away from other plant content creators. That doesn't mean that I don't follow or watch any of them. I do have a few that I like to watch and follow, but those are mainly people that I have formed connections with very early in my plant journey. Like AJ, for example, like Tim from Grow Vertical, like Pass uh, Plant Life. Um, I love Royce from uh, the Netherlands, um, for example. Those are people I have made connections with very early on. I really like them as people, not necessarily as content creators. Right? So I want to support them and I like talking to them and so on. When you spend the amount of time with plants that I do, surrounded by them, caring for them, but also then filming them, talking about them, answering questions about them, um, editing videos and so on, you run risk of just overstimulation. So at one stage, I was kind of like, I'm so over it. I don't want to produce any more plant content. I don't want to do any more plant stuff because I'm just way over exposed way oversaturated. Um, I don't think these are the right words, but you know what I mean. So I decided before I have complete plant fatigue, I stopped watching plant content, if that makes sense. And I really just got my social media algorithms to show me other things. Um, Life is much more than just plants. I have many other interests. I love sports. I love photography. I love pop culture and so on, right? Like there are so many things. I love traveling. Um, not that I do a lot of traveling, but I watch like watching other people travel and so on. So I really enjoyed having, I like fashion even. I even like fashion. Not that I wear anything but a black t-shirt, but I like other people wearing some fancy stuff sometimes. So I don't know, like I really like the internet for what the internet can be sometimes, but I really wanted to make sure that my internet, my algorithm isn't just plants, 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 plants. Maybe the other consideration in relation to this whole content creation thing is that I also really started going away from, not going away, I'm still very active on Instagram and TikTok, but my preference is definitely YouTube. I just feel like Instagram and TikTok is really wanting content creators to produce volume. One moment, please, you're running out of battery. They really just want you to bang out content. Bam, bam, bam. Everybody's attention span is like two and a half seconds. So it's like hook them in. Um, and quality is just usually disregarded. To go, everybody just wants to go viral. To go viral these days, I feel like you need to be controversial. You need to really rub people the wrong way for them to want to engage with you on Instagram, I feel like, right? People engage when they're really outraged. They're like, I can't believe, like the only videos that ever do well is when I shake a plant and people are outraged that I'm shaking the plant. And it's like, oh my God, I can't believe you're shaking your plant, blah, blah, blah. Or people are like outraged that, oh my God, I can't believe you can shake your plant. If I just look at mine, it dies, something like that. So, and that's not necessarily what I wanna do. I don't necessarily want to sit here. I don't want my creative process to be what is the most controversial thing I could possibly say or do so that people want to engage with my content so that I go viral? What's the, what's the bloody point? I want to create fun content. I want to make people laugh to an extent, right? Like I think that is actually my favorite part of content I can create. If I can make somebody stay by bringing a little bit of joy into their life by making them laugh. But at the same time, I also want the content to be informative. Plants is a fairly information heavy topic. And I think YouTube is a good way of bringing all of that across. So in general, I just produce more for YouTube. I also consume more on YouTube than I've ever had. Plus this day and age, I have connections in the plant community. I have people like AJ, I have people like Tim from Grow Vertical. If I want inspiration, if I want help, if I want to learn something new, if I want to see new plants, I have people in my actual life uh, these days that can do that. I don't need to rely on social media uh, for all of that. Sorry, really long winded answer again, but uh, yeah, I just like to speak my mind. I think this is what this video is all about, right? What kind of mandula do you have? I assume it's not a basic mandula pothos. 
is there a non-basic one? I don't know. Like Mangelopothos is Mangelopothos. It's a accepted cultivar. I think that's the correct terminology. And they should all pretty much be the same or very similar. Now, plants vary in uh, variegation, of course. Not uh, every mangela is going to have the same amount of variegation. And plants can vary in shape based on the conditions that they're growing in the first place. Um, I think the video that I filmed at uh, Tim's from Grow Vertical was a really good example where he has the same plant and he just changed the position around and once it grew a really long narrow leaf, the other time it grew a really uh, like shorter, thicker leaf instead and it was purely based on light exposure for example. So. Just because your plant doesn't look exactly like my plant doesn't mean that they're completely different plants. Look at you and I, like we probably, I mean, I don't know who you are, but we probably look very, very different despite the fact that 99.99% of our DNA is actually the same. Same can apply to plants as well. I don't, that's actually the worst part about the plant community. Did I say that earlier? I feel like I've been sitting here all day already. The fact that we as humans have the need to put labels on everything that has evolved over millions of years of evolution. I know that Mangela has not evolved from evolution. That was definitely a cultivar. But you know what I mean? Like we are so desperate to put words on everything. Every single plant name was made up. The plant doesn't know it's called philodendron melanochrysum. The plant just knows that it's always been like that or it evolved over millions of years to be like this. We reclassify plants. Thermatophyllums used to be philodendrons. Now people say, oh, well, it used to be a philodendron. It's like, it used to not be a philodendron. It never was a philodendron. Even the philodendron <laughs> used to not be a philodendron. We just gave it the word philodendron. If that makes sense. You know what I mean? No. I don't know. Maybe I need more coffee. Definitely going way off topic. Basically, I think I have a regular Mangela. The Mangela, the one and only Mangela that I think is available for purchase. I haven't really seen any other type or form or cultivar of Mangela around. Um, how would you deal with meeting a partner that doesn't enjoy plants? We have to negotiate space with existing plants and potential future plants in my home. I guess the question is, would plants just be a non-negotiable item? I suppose that also depends on your partner. Who do you love more, the plants or your partner? I suppose you're asking me personally. Yeah, you're asking how would you deal, okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm usually trying to like broaden the question, make it applicable to as many people and things as possible, but I think you're just after my opinion. Um, I think it would be a bit of a non-negotiable, but I think with me it's larger than just the actual plants and having them in my apartment. These plants are also part of my job, uh, my, my side hustle. So it would basically be disrespectful to my business uh, at the same time. So I think that would bother me more than if somebody says, I don't want my apartment to be filled with plants because I don't appreciate the aesthetic. Very questionable aesthetic choice though. Come on, who wouldn't enjoy living in my house? I mean, I do need to accept the fact that people's tastes are different and some people would probably not enjoy living in my house, but I feel like if I'd had a partner whose aesthetic preference is so different to mine, we probably would have a lot of other things um, that we disagree on as well. So it might not necessarily be a good fit. Would you ever dapple into the Hoya species and why? No, because I don't necessarily like the aesthetic. But that doesn't mean that I would be opposed to having maybe one or two Hoyas because the flowers can be nice, but I don't see myself being like a Hoya collector and want to get all the species and like, oh my God, look at this one. This is subspecies, whatever. I'm like, mm, nah, not really. I think there are other plants to explore for me. How do you avoid browning on the white portion of a variegated Monstera? You cannot. The white portion is useless. It will brown. What you can do, however, is you can prevent, you can delay the browning of the white part. So if it is in a really dry environment, the white part might become really crispy. If it's in a really humid environment, the white part can get really, um, or has, can get fungal issues really quickly. So 
not too high humidity, not too low humidity would be perfect. Um, avoiding, sector, avoiding sectoral um, variegation would also be a tip. Obviously you can't avoid it if you already have the plant, but if you're selecting a plant to buy in the first place, I like a more mottled variegation rather than having like a half-half. The white half is gonna die, the green half is gonna look perfectly fine. So your half-half Monstera is eventually just half Monstera. So um, yeah, I think those would be things that I do or that's things that I did. I'd have a more mottled variegated Monstera. It's actually more on the low variegated side as well, which again is not my choice, but I think it really helps in keeping the white bits white. Uh, and then the conditions don't go too extreme on the humidity. Obviously, really harsh sun exposure and so on can turn the white bits into mush really quickly as well. Next one, why some of my plants like philodendron pink princes don't grow into my moss pole and it's gotten worse since I attached the moss pole. Why, why some of my plants like pink princes don't grow onto my moss pole and it's gotten worse since I attached the moss pole. Okay, the second part doesn't 100% make sense, but let's read between the lines. You have a plant and it's not attaching to the moss pole. I have a few questions to ask, but you can't answer. First of all, are you keeping the pole moist? If you're not keeping the pole moist, the root won't necessarily be attracted to it. Roots seek moisture. That's their job, right? Roots need to go where the moisture is to absorb all of the moisture and provide the plant with it. So roots seek moisture. If you keep the moss pole moist, you should have success in your plant rooting into your moss pole. If your plant is not happy, it's not going to grow anything, neither grow leaf nor roots. So maybe that's another thing. Maybe you're not providing your plant with great conditions for the plant to thrive so the plant can actually grow. So again, I'm not too sure, I would probably need a little bit more detail to um, really, um, you know, understand the scenario better. But yeah, the principle is still the same. If you give your plant great conditions that it thrives in, it will grow. If it grows, root growth will be inevitable. Roots will seek moisture. So if you keep your moss pore moist, it will happen eventually. I've had my tenure as well where I followed all of the principles and it was growing and it was just not necessarily attaching to the moss pole. Put it in the greenhouse and it did. And really the difference here is that the greenhouse is the perfect condition for the plant. So maybe your plant isn't happy in the first place. The moss pole isn't miraculously going to change that. The moss pole is just there to provide it support and an extension of the root system. The moss pole is not going to change your plant's uh, fight from uh, about to die to, oh my God, thriving miraculously, uh, amazing, let's shake it on Instagram. So yeah, keep that in mind. Conditions set the growth potential. The moss pole is just a, a part of your care approach. Uh, we'll never be able to compensate for a lack of great conditions. What type of fertilizer do you use? And how do you grow a plant beautiful and big? Mine is so sad and only has two leaves, it has grown. All right, I think the second question we answered quite substantially. Grow them in conditions that are close to the natural uh, environment and then realize the potential that the condition set by providing appropriate care. Plenty of tutorials on that on my channel. What fertilizer I use? Um, is always in the description of every single video. I use, I use GT Foliage Focus, which basically has the 12 essential nutrients that plants need to thrive. Yep, you need more than just the NPK. There's 12 that your plants need and Foliage Focus has all 12 of them in the right ratio, readily available so I can water it, so I provide it with every watering. The plant just absorbs it, yummy, 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 and thrives. Now in addition to the 12 essential nutrients that Foliage Focus provides, I also provide my plants with um, a new GT product which is called Root Zone and I've been trialing it for um, over a year now and it's really great for the overall health of the plant. It's called Root Zone because well it mainly focuses on roots but healthy roots equals healthy plant. So Root Zone uh, is an organic additive that I put um, into the water with the foliage focus and it has um, it, it basically oh my god was it folic acid thiamine there's something else basically there are some organic additives that can help the plant thrive or help the plant grow stronger but are necessarily essential 
think about it from a human perspective, you have some essential things that you need to eat to survive. But technically you could survive just eating potato because it has all of the essential things. That's why they grow potato on Mars, right? So you can survive growing potato, but are you gonna thrive to your full potential? Is every bodily function that you've got like optimized by a 100% potato diet? Probably not. Um, so that's kind of like, maybe that's a stupid analogy, but that's how I kind of like to explain foliage focus. Foliage focus is the basic. Without these nutrients, your plant isn't gonna grow in the first place. Root zone is the additive. If your plant is already thriving and you want that little bit of extra, just put a little bit of that in the mix as well. Again, everything in the description about it. Um, unfortunately, it's only available in Australia and the US, and I think Canada has somebody who distributes as well. I've also heard that GT is working on a European distribution, but it is not necessarily available worldwide. If you can't get your hands on GT, then I honestly don't know. I've only ever grown plants in Australia, so I'm only familiar with uh, products available over here. Can you make another video of philodendron sodoroid propagation? Um, probably not anytime soon, but honestly, my propagation methods are all the same. They're not necessarily specific to the species. I don't propagate a sodoroid different to a Milano, to a, so to a Splendid, to a Vericosum and so on. I have an in-depth video on propagation, which is linked in my uh, Mosspol playlist. Um, so I'd recommend you check this one out. Which plant should I start with? Monstera, Pothos, if I don't have in off light in my room, if I, if I don't have in off light, if I don't have in off light in my rooms, will a $20 light on the internet do the trick? No offense, but I can't afford the $200 light you use. Yes, you can use a normal LED light, but it will not be as good in optimizing photosynthesis as possible if that makes sense so obviously these grow lights have been designed to optimize the wavelength of light that plants can absorb to optimize photosynthesis whereas these normal leds they are created for human consumption so they're created to produce light that we as humans can see the light we as humans can see and the light that plants use to do photosynthesis is not the same wavelength but still better than nothing and especially if you use it just to supplement light. I'm not too sure I didn't understand this sentence, but I'm assuming you have some sort of light in your room, but not enough. Basically, if you're using an LED just to supplement the light and there's already some natural light, then it should be fine. But honestly, proof is in the pudding ultimately. Give it a try and uh, go for it. Now, you absolutely don't have to buy um, the lights that I use. The lights that I use, I have chosen because of the results that they give me, but a huge factor in why I chose these lights is aesthetic. They work with the aesthetic of my apartment. I don't wanna have something ugly standing in my apartment nonstop, it's beaming light at something. I don't want to have purple grow lights. I don't want to have like super white grow lights and so on. Like aesthetics are always the driving factor in anything that I do within uh, my apartment over here. So a huge reason why they're so expensive is because, well, they're actually nice, aesthetically designed. They're made from um, good materials like uh, aluminium, for example, instead of just plastic. And they have a really long lifespan. So basically this light should technically never really break. So I suppose you're paying a little bit more money up front rather than having to replace the light uh, frequently over the years and so on. But each to their own, all I do on my channel really is show you the products that I use, show you the results of them, and then I give you as much information so you can hopefully make an educated decision on whether or not you want to use this product or not. No offense if you don't want to use the products that I use. So try an LED light. I've seen people have success with it and uh, see how you go. Now, what plants you should start off with? I think Apothos makes a great starter plant, but also consider what plants are actually available in the country that you're in and what tickles your fancy. Don't grow a plant just because I said it. If you don't like it, don't grow it. Should I water my moss pole even if the plant hasn't grabbed onto it yet? 
Yes and no. While you technically don't need to water the moss pile while there's no roots in it because you're not watering the moss pile for the sake of the moss pile, you're watering the moss pile for the sake of the roots that should be within the moss pile. If you don't water it, then you probably won't ever have roots in it. Or the roots won't be water roots, they'll just be aerial roots like the ones that just hang in the air. Um, so what I usually do, it also depends on whereabouts the plant is. So for example, if it's in my greenhouse, I still just spray the whole thing. Um, but what you can do is you can just keep the part of the pole that the plant is closest to uh, slightly moist by spraying it. Uh, and that way you still have that moisture that is going to attract the roots. And then obviously once the plant is properly attached and it's going to root system, that's when you want to at the very least water the part of the moss pole that has the roots in it. You always water the roots, not the substrate. But I actually find going around and spraying moss poles to be much more work because you're just spraying the surface, it's going to dry out really quickly, spraying makes a mess, water goes everywhere and so on. So I actually just find keeping the whole moss pole moist using my upside down water bottle technique a much easier way of watering. Uh, but you don't have to, no. I have a cutting of Monstera which has two nodes. How shall I prepare its potting mix so that it grows its node and it's summer here but monsoon season in my country. Um, all right, reading between the lines again over here. Well, you, I'm assuming you want to grow roots out of the node. So what I would do, I would propagate the node in water first. I propagate all my monsteros in water and then once the node has grown roots, then you can pot it up. If you have two nodes on that plant, what you could do is you could have one node in water propagating, then pot it up and put a moss pole on it and have that second node face the moss pole. So you then keep the moss pole moist and that second node is then also going to uh, send roots into it. Or what you could do is you could cut that cutting in half, have two single node cuttings and propagate them both. That's probably what I would do, yeah. I would probably cut it. How do you truly keep them pest free? I struggle with this one so bad. I think I answered that already as well because I like to go off topic. I don't keep my uh, plants pest free. They're just at a manageable level where the pests aren't causing enough damage so that it's really detrimental to the plant. Um, but yeah, they are definitely not pest free. My plants are definitely not perfect. You probably just choose to ignore the imperfections when it comes to my plants and you're much more critical with yours. Uh, but yeah, I live in Australia, I have my windows open all the time, 50% of my plant collection is even growing outside in the first place. I think wanting to be pest free is completely unrealistic uh, unless you grow in a sterile environment, basically in a lab. Um, why is my Thai constellation growing so slowly? It's a one leaf cutting, rooted, it's by the window, help please. All right, being by the window doesn't tell me anything. There could be the biggest uh, tree outside that window. That window could be facing south if you're in the southern hemisphere, north if you're in the northern hemisphere. So the window could basically get no light, uh, to be honest. So being in the window means nothing. I need to know if it gets light or not. But I don't think the light is necessarily the issue over here. Monsteras, in my opinion, are not the greatest to propagate. I really don't like propagating ties. I think it's such a time consuming thing to do. So you said it's a one leaf rooted cutting. Most likely that cutting is going to root for a really long time and just produce a lot of roots. And eventually, once it's almost root bound and you're almost wanting to repot it, that's when it starts growing leaves. So don't repot it. I find that my monsteros only really start growing leaves once they're already root bound. So give it a small pot. Don't give your small cutting a huge pot. That cutting is just going to grow roots for the rest of its life, I feel like. Um, and I've specifically uh, noticed that with uh, Deliciosa and Thai Constellation is just the type of Deliciosa. Right? Last question. Oh my God, we made it. And it's the easiest question to answer out of all of them. If you had to choose between bread and all of your plants, who are you choosing? Excuse me. I need to make a decision. Do you want to go to a shelter? No. 
<laughs> I was just kidding, my baby. I would always choose you. Always. Yes, of course, my baby. You choose me too? Okay, thank you. That's good. You're on the same page. Well, I think we answered that for you. Of course, we choose each other over plants. Excuse me. This little baby is my everything. And nothing is ever going to come between us. Not even 150 plants. And I think this was a trick question. I don't think anybody would possibly think I'd choose the plants over bread. Anyway, we got through them in the end. That was good. It's always nice to see what sort of questions you've got for me because those are also things that I will incorporate in all of my videos going forward, right? The questions that uh, some of you ask, probably a lot of other people were thinking as well. When you guys give me really uh, like situational questions, like they're just specific to you, your specific plant isn't doing well and so on, it's very, very hard for me to troubleshoot without knowing the conditions and the history of the plant. Um, I tend to do a little better with the more general questions, but I still hope that this was of value to you and I hope that some of my answers gave you some more insight or at the very least maybe made you laugh a little bit. Who knows? Again, so sorry for taking five months to answer these questions. I promise I won't forget the next one. I actually really enjoy doing this and I know you guys also enjoy this more podcast style content that you can just put on in the background and go and do your own thing. I like doing that too. Just sit down. It's almost like having a chat, not prepared. I didn't prepare these questions or anything like that. It's literally just I read them and then whew, verbal diarrhea coming your way. Happy days. Alrighty, I'm gonna probably have a little nap. <laughs> that was plenty exhausting. So I think Brett and I are gonna have a little nap and I'll see you in my next video. Bye. Sleepy, sleepy time.